it is only through your power that, that we can find strength, that we can find uh, knowledge. So, Lord, I pray now that, that your Holy Spirit would bless in this place, that we would just experience you this morning. We would hear from you. Jesus, in your name, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning again. Again, we're jumping into Philippians. Um, have any of you ever heard of Aaron Ralston? Name, name ring a bell to anyone? No? So he's defined as an American outdoorsman, whatever that exactly means. Um, he's now a motivational speaker, and he became an author in 2004. And then in 2010, this movie starring James Franco uh, came out about him. 127 hours. So this is Aaron's story. And Aaron shared <clears throat> that, you know, outside of like a little opening scene and then this weird dream sequence in the midst of the movie, uh, that this movie is pretty much like a documentary of what, what went down, what happened with him. And so it's about Aaron. He's this, he's, he's canyoning, it's called. I'll explain what that is in a minute. So he's canyoning somewhere in Utah. He's kind of a loner guy. He takes off for the weekend, not telling anywhere where, anyone where he's going. And so canyoning is what we're seeing in the movie poster, is is moving between canyons at some ridiculousness like that. So crawling through them, running through them, um, super difficult stuff. And so this boulder that we actually see in the poster, uh, as he's canyoning, it shifts, drops down, and falls a good distance, and Aaron falls with the boulder. And the boulder lands on his hand, which we can see depicted there. Um, and he begins yelling and screaming for anyone to be able to help him. And, it, and the camera pans out from, from above him and, and goes higher and higher. And he gets to the top of the canyon, and it's pretty quiet. Like, you can't really hear his yelling and screaming. And he keeps panning out to show this vast, empty, desert canyon that you can't, you can't hear him screaming at all at this point. And so this happens on Saturday. And, and so after he's done, you know, screaming and freaking out for a minute, he composes himself and, and pulls out everything he has on him out, out of, on, in his pockets, out of his backpack. He's got some, some rope, flashlight, small amount of food, just a small amount of water, and a little multi-tool kit um, with some pliers and a little dull pocket knife on it. Not much. And so he, attempt, he's try, he starts to try to get out, and he attempts to lift the rock up by leveraging it with some rope and trying to hook it onto something above him and pulling the rope up, and nothing's happening. He tries throwing the rope past him to hook on to anything to, again, try and leverage himself out of this position, move the rock at all. Nothing's happening at all. Again, tries yelling and screaming for help, and you see like he's losing his mind, and days are passing. And then, finally, he pulls out this little cheap multi-tool kit, opens up the, the dull knife on it, and stares at it for a minute, and starts picking away at the rock. And he thinks that's going to work. And it, the rock moves a little bit, but he's, he shares that as the rock's moving, he's realizing that his hand is actually supporting the boulder. So as the rock moves, nothing's actually happening. Um, and so around 120 hours pass. Does anybody off the top of your head know how long that is? Five days. Yeah, five days. So it's Thursday now. He's been stuck there since Saturday. It's been five days. So again, he goes and looks at this, this multi-tool. He looks at his arm, and he tourniquets. He wraps up his arm from a, with a camelback like tube insulation. And sure enough, the moment that, you know, everyone knew was, was coming, who saw this movie, saw the trailer commercial for this movie, he begins to saw his arm off with this dull knife, cutting through flesh, muscle, nerves, bones. Like right right here on his arm, he's, he's cutting it off. And I can't imagine the pain that he would have gone through, that he would have had to endure to, to survive, to get out of this situation. And obviously he does survive. He did. He got out. He's he's rescued afterwards. 
And so what does this story teach us? Obviously that the activity of canyoning is a terrible idea. So wouldn't recommend that. But more importantly, it teaches us that humans will do remarkable things in order to live, in order to survive. And we've, we've witnessed this in, in uh, this fight for, for survival in horrific ways as well. Seeing footage of natural disasters, terrorist attacks, acts of violence. We see the aftermath of people fleeing in fear. And now a big question that I think each one of us individually has to ask ourselves today is what are you living for? What are you living for? <clears throat> In this short life, we don't know how long we'll live for. So again, what, what are you living for? This morning, like I said earlier, we're continuing our ser- series in Philippians, looking at the church in Philippi and the author of this letter, Paul, who is who Paul is just insatiably consumed with Jesus. And so you can open your Bibles now to Philippians chapter 119. If you don't have a Bible, you can find a blue Bible in the seat in front of you, and you want to open that up because the passage won't be on the screen. Um, 119, page 1011, uh, if, it's in, if you have the blue Bible there. And we're going to be finishing off chapter 1 this morning, where Paul, again, while writing from a Roman prison, this chained-up man tells us about a life worth living and a death worth dying. So let's, let's read this together now. Philippians 1, 19-30 says this, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out my, for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For for if I am to go on living in this body, this means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart And be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence... I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. It's like the whole letter of Philippians, this this passage is just packed full of powerful scripture. And it has in it one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's one of these like classic coffee cup bumper stick verses. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a pretty heavy sentence. Nine words. So I want to I want to read it all together here now. So to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's powerful. But what does it mean? We're going to spend the majority of our time this morning looking at this verse. Because again, we need to ask ourselves this important question. What are we living for? Because what what we're living for gives us a good picture of what death looks like to us. We're living for our jobs, for our careers. Then losing our job is, is dying. We're living for money to grow in wealth, then being broke is dying. We can live for entertainment, for family, for ourselves. But dying in any of these things, there's no gain. Simply loss and death. Paul claims that he is living for Christ, and this is a man who is insatiably consumed with Jesus. He is living for Christ. And last week, Pastor Brent talked about four marks of someone who is insatiably consumed with Jesus. And I want to add a fifth to that to that list, which really encompasses each one of those points that he made last week. And that's that's living for Christ. 
To be insatiably consumed with Jesus, you're obviously living for Christ. So what does it mean to live for Christ? First off, we need to acknowledge that we owe everything to Christ. We owe everything to Christ. Our whole lives, our finances, our jobs, our time, all our giftings, our salvation. We owe it all to Jesus. And back in January, in the midst of our One Vision series, I had the opportunity to wrap up that series and talk about a one serve for the year. In that message, we looked at the, the parable of the talents. We're a master who is, is Jesus in this situation. He, he comes and gives his servants, uh, gives each one of his servants bags of gold. And his first two servants, they use this gift to go and, and they multiply it and do great works. And when they meet the master again, they're met with these words of encouragement. Well done, good and faithful servant. That would be a pretty good thing to hear from Jesus when we see him again. And the third servant comes to the master and gives him back the gold he was given. And just, just exactly what he was given. And says, you know what, I, I was too scared to use it, ultimately. I was too scared to use it. And his response that he gets is not one we want to hear when we meet Jesus. And it is, you wicked, lazy servant. Our time, our finances, our spiritual giftings, we owe all of that to Jesus to use it to glorify him, to use it to make his name famous. When we're acknowledging that and truly living that out, <clears throat> that's a good starting sign that we're living our lives for Christ. Next, we need to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Master. For those of you that have accepted Christ, you're probably like, oh, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. I've kind of done that already. Because in, you know, in coming to salvation, we, we speak with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And it's great, that's necessary. But are we living that out after the fact? Are we living that out that Jesus is Master and Jesus is Lord? Do we start our days in prayer asking Jesus what he would have for us today? How we're going to make him famous today? When I think about the relationship between a master and a servant, I don't, I don't think about the servant taken off for the day and just going and doing whatever he wants before checking in with the master. I see the servant, I see us going to the master, laying down our own wants, our own needs, our own desires, and, and saying, Master, what would you have of me today? What would you have of me today? And maybe the reality is that we have other masters that get in the way of this reality. And Jesus had some thoughts about serving two masters. In his most popular sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, it says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are unhealth or if your eyes are healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We simply cannot serve two masters. And for many of us, our master can easily become money. It can rule over us. Because there's just a simple reality even that we actually have a need for money. In our world, our culture, to, to pay for our homes, to feed our families. There's a real practical need. But it can quickly rule over us for the need for, for more, for bigger and better. And it can, can become extremely dangerous extremely quickly. And I, I just have a, a, a footnote. And you might remember last week, Pastor Brent had a footnote as well. And, and this is the exact same thing he said last week. Because maybe you've realized, you know, these first two points, each have talked about finances and money. And so this is, just, this is so important that the, the evidence that Jesus is everything to you, the evidence that you were insatiably consumed by Jesus is that if it's reached your wallet, your bank, bank statement will tell you 
and everyone else if you're living for Christ. Your wallet will reveal what you're living for. And again, we need to see Jesus as Master and Lord. Thirdly, to be living in Christ, we're sharing in His death and resurrection. That we've died, we're, we're living out this life that we've died to ourselves and have ris- risen anew with Him. And this is so wonderfully illustrated in baptism. The, the actual act of water baptism, of, of dying to ourselves and being raised anew is, is symbolic of this. And just two weeks ago, we had the awesome privilege of seeing five people get baptized. And for myself, I got, I got to be in the tank with, with four of our students, and I want to highlight two of them right now, Jordan and Jeremy. And I've known these guys for about a year, and I have seen Jesus work radically in their lives. What was really exciting for me is that af- after the service, um, I had a, a couple of their extended family come up to me and, and just share that they seen just such a change in them, a shift in them that they've seen a greater willingness for them to, uh, and desire even for them to serve, to help out, a greater joy fill them. And that's exciting because they're sharing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And let me, let me say this too, this can't, this sharing in Christ's death and resurrection cannot happen on our own. First, Christ needs to die and be resurrected. We can't do that, but it's happened, so check. That's happened. And next, we need the Holy Spirit working in our lives and doing that transformative work. It's not just a matter of us changing our attitude and being the best us we can be. It's about living a new life that can only be found in Jesus. And lastly, living for Christ means that we as believers... (coughs) Excuse me. We as believers recognize that everything of value is found in Christ. The things of this world that, that once seemed so important have lost their attraction. Nothing compares to the infinite value of knowing Christ. This is probably for myself where my own brokenness is, is revealed. Because, yeah, I completely see value in everything that, that is of Jesus. But my heart and my desires reveal that I do put a lot of value in things of this world. A great example of this, not just for myself, but for the you know world, is just two weeks ago, the newest Avengers movie came out around the world. And the world has put such a high value on this movie, such a big deal for fans around the world. It's the, the finale of what's been a 22-movie series that's been running 11 years with characters that people love and are invested in. And here's some of the headlines that have come out in the past couple weeks in regards to Avengers Endgame and the value that, that's being placed on it. So, f- before this first one, so tickets for this movie went on sale like two months before the movie came out and all the opening nights sold out. And uh, so this headline came out shortly after that. Is Avengers Endgame tickets are so hard to get. People are selling them on eBay for over $2,000. That's a lot of money. Um... This next one is airmen arrested for going AWOL to see Avengers Endgame. And this was a South Korean uh, Air Force officer arrested. Woman hospitalized after crying too much during Avengers Endgame. These are all real headlines. I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't make them up. Um, and before I show this next one... Uh, Homer Simpson, I think, perfectly illustrates it as well, where it's like this flashback in a, in a Simpsons episode, and, and Homer's going to see The Empire Strikes Back in 1981, and he's walking past, like, he goes and sees it, and he walks out of the theater, he's walking past a group of people waiting to be let into the theater to go see this movie, and he's like, wow, I can't believe that Darth Vader was Luke's father. And everyone's like, ah! So, somebody did this, I think, more intentionally in, in China, I think, uh, just outside the theater as people are waiting to get in. And so Avengers Endgame fan reportedly beaten up for spoiling movie. <laughs> and this next one is a little bit like, you know, exaggerated, uh, but that's okay. It's, it's more humorous and it's funny. And it's youth pastor spoils Endgame on stage, turning the next gener- generation away from the gospel. So he spoiled it. I don't think he actually turned them away from the gospel. This movie shattered box office records. 
made over a billion dollars in its opening weekend. It continues to break records, uh, and, and my guess is maybe by the end of today, if not by the end of next weekend, it's going to be the highest grossing movie of all time. And by the time it's done, we'll have made over $3 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of value. And for myself, too, like... Kara and I, we, you know, we went on opening night. We did not spend $2,000 for tickets. We just paid a normal ticket price. Both of us had a good cry in the midst of the movie. Neither of us were hospitalized, though, so that's good. But we still see the value in it. And even in our guys' youth small group, the topic of the movie came up, and, and we're, we're chatting about it, we're talking about it, and one of, one of our students, Francis Dion, sarcastically asked, Josh, you saw Endgame. How did it further your relationship with Jesus? Yeah, what's that about? (laughs) So, well, Francis, it didn't. But Paul puts it great later on in Philippians, in in, in chapter 3 of Philippians 7 to 8. It says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. And Pastor Brent mentioned this this last week, this this uh, verse 8 here. And this word garbage in other translations, rubbish, literally means excrement, poop. I know for myself, I still have a ways to go in this still, but to truly be living for Christ, I need to be able to push the Avengers aside, push entertainment aside that I see as valuable. Anything that I see as valuable that isn't of Jesus and recognize it as excrement because I have a knowledge of Jesus and what he's done. When Paul proclaims that to live is Christ, This is what living for Christ is all about. Acknowledging that we owe everything to Christ. Acknowledging Christ as Lord and Master. Sharing in Christ's death and resurrection. And recognizing that everything of value is found in Christ. So what does the second half of the sentence mean? Paul says to live is Christ, but then he says, and to die is gain. What does that mean? For us as Christians, for us as believers, death should hold no fear. And Jesus says this in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? We hold no fear of of death because we know that death leads to greater life. For believers, it leads into the Lord's presence, and that's a glorious, amazing thing. So I ask you this question too, and it's maybe even a harder question than what are you living for? But would you say that you're ready to die? Could you say that that would be gain? That would be good? Again, I see my own brokenness in this area because there's still things I want out out of this world, out of this life I'm currently living and it, they're not bad things. But it reveals my own selfishness. It reveals what I'm truly living for. What are you living for? When we're living for Christ, then dying truly is gain. When we're living for anything else, there's not a lot of gain in dying. There's no, it's, it's just dying. Now, looking at these last few verses, I believe that that Paul is saying that heaven will be so much greater than our time on earth. I know he's saying that. I know that to be true, that heaven will be greater than our time on earth. What I feel confident saying, though, is that I don't think Paul is saying that he'd rather be dead than continue on earth. Again, Paul is writing this from a Roman prison cell, awaiting trial. And he knows full well that the outcome is that he is either going to be walking away and and free to go or he'll be executed so in the next couple verses he's challenged with the dilemma of which will be better for him now and better for the kingdom of God and so in verse 
of Philippians 1 of verse 22. It says this. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Again, his attitude is not that of, ah, you know what, I would rather be dead than continue on with this life. But his attitude is that it's going to be amazing in the Lord's presence. It's going to be incredible, in fact. But I'm pretty sure I'm going to get through this. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to be there to, to continue to encourage you and spur you on. Can you imagine, though, the difficulty that the Roman soldiers would have had faced in, in trying to intimidate or interrogate Paul? The Roman soldiers are like, okay, Paul, if you don't cooperate with us, we're going to execute you. Paul's like, that's amazing! Then, I, then I, I get to be in the presence of the Lord. That'll be so great! They're like, oh, okay. Well, we'll let you live then. Like, that would be wonderful too. Because then I get to they need to grow the body of Christ and encourage them. Okay, oh. Paul, then we, you know what? We're just going to torture you. You are going to go through some serious suffering. That's okay too. Because it will be all for Christ's glory. And it will honor him. And Paul does conclude this chapter in talking about suffering. And the NLT translation puts it, the, it puts it in these words in Philippians 1.29. It says, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. <clears throat> to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Living for Christ is absolutely the life to the full that Jesus promised us. But Jesus and Paul both make it exceptionally clear that life to the full doesn't come without some suffering. It's not a perfect life of how we would want it, how we would see it necessarily. Because that life is a life of living for ourselves. That life is a life of selfishness. To be insatiably consumed with Jesus, we must be living for Christ. So again, I ask you today, what are you living for? What are you living for? I'm going to call the worship team up now, and, and I just want to spend some time in prayer asking God to reveal that to each one of us. What, what are we living for? Would you join me in prayer? Lord, again, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to enter into relationship with you, to live for you. Lord, recognizing that even in, in our death, entering into your presence will be so great. To live <clears throat> to live as Christ, to die as gain. So Jesus, I pray that you would reveal to each one here what we are truly living for. I'm sure it's it's already come to the forefront of our minds or our hearts and we're like ah yeah this is what I'm living for Jesus allow us to to lay that down at the foot of your cross and said to live for you for your glory for your honor Jesus we thank you in your name